1999. That was a good year, eh? James Sidon, was that a good year? Well, that's when you got your driving <laughs> license. But more significantly, this is when I joined the mining industry. <laughs> and on the first day of work at SIK, I noticed something odd. Yeah? So I went down the hall and I met this guy that's digitizing madly on screen. <clears throat> He said, what are you doing? I'm making a geological model. I didn't know anything about geological models. I was bumming around at universities before that, so I had no idea. So he was sort of drawing these loops around high grade. I said, well, that's, yeah, you're doing contouring. He looks at me and thinks, what? Yeah, contouring, you know. You could do that using a computer. What? He goes, no, you can't do that. That's like, you can't let a computer do all the work. You know, it's important. So let me get this straight. I said, you're a geological modeler, so you spent three, four years at university studying geology, and you are digitizing these things on screen. And he looked at me and confused, what? So where did you do your geology degree? I, said, well, I didn't do a geology degree. What? Well, I'm a surveyor from South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're, doing, you're making geological models and you're a surveyor? I didn't get it, you know. So I went down the, went down the hall and I met uh, Cam McQuaig and he was drawing all sorts of diagrams, you know, these block diagrams with his pencil on his notebook. He said, what are you doing there? And he goes, oh, these are the geological, you know, summary of what I'm trying to sort of convey to the client. So why don't you just get that from the drill hole data? You know, just build a model. He looked at me and, well, that, you can't do that. The surveyor does that. So, you know, this is very strange. And this is when I realized that drawings like this were being produced by many people, by geologists. And let's, you know, you guys know what Gray's Anatomy looks like. You know, this looks a pretty complicated uh, book with a lot of good illustrations based on fact. Now, if a geologist were to do that book, it would look more like this. <laughs> So that's when I had a realization, you see. These are all the clues that were coming up on the first day of work. <laughs> it was quite amazing. Do you know what it was? No? We were in the matrix. <laughs> and it happened over such a long time, you didn't even know that it happened. <laughs> right? Um, you probably haven't, some of you may not have seen the Matrix movie, but Matrix is, you know, these. People are living their daily lives, but in actual fact, they're living in a, a simulation, a computer simulation that is created by uh, computers, machines, who, who have taken over the world. Okay? And, and the only clue that you know that you're in a simulation is that you have these glitches. So this is what I was experiencing at SIK. I was, I was seeing, you know, like a surveyor making geological models. That, that didn't make any sense to me. So, today... Like the movie, Neo was given a choice to stay in the Matrix by taking the blue pill or go outside and see the real world. So what would you do today? Who wants to go and see the real world? That's what I'm trying to present, so anyone? So I want, I want to show you the real world, okay? And first of all, I'm going to show you how stereo nets work in the real world. These are the stereo plots in the matrix. Now, can someone tell me why these grids are on these, these stereo nets? Can anyone tell me? The, the Lambert grid, that's what I'm referring to. Sorry? To be able to measure things. Well, in actual fact, you can't actually measure anything from with using this grid, okay? So if your plane is, say, dipping perfectly east-west, you can measure the dip of that plane, okay? If you want to measure that, if you want to know what that value is of that, of that pole, for example, you can't use that grid to read, read that off. 
Unless you, yeah, unless you twist it in the software, right? So the grid actually doesn't do anything, but people plot it anyway because everyone else is doing it. That's, that's the only reason I can think of, and that's because you're in the matrix, you see? You're sort of uh, fooled into believing that that's a good thing, it's sure good, because everyone else is doing it. <laughs> now, I'm going to introduce you to you the world coordinate system and the user coordinate system. This is the world coordinate system. So like a coordinate system of a room, for example, you know, right here. This is the baby coordinate system. So this is something that is actually in the medical establishment, this is actually computed automatically. So if you go under a scanner or something like that, it'll know your coordinate system straight away. It doesn't matter what the room orientation is or the world orientation is, it's irrelevant, actually. So what you need to know in order to get this image here, that is a slice through using the, the baby coordinate system, the user coordinate system. So this is the default grid. This is world coordinate system, okay? <coughs> this is the user coordinate system. All it is is that I rotate the grid according to the eigenvectors of, of this data set. That's all it is. Now, just by doing that, you'd be able to actually accelerate your interpretation of your stereo nets incredibly fast. We are going to be looking at more than 60 stereo nets in this talk. And you are going to see the sense in all of that I plot and be able to interpret what I show you. So this is a cylindrical fold, horizontal. So your traditional grid, that would make sense using the traditional grid, north-south. This is plunging 20 degrees towards the north. You can see that the grid is, is plunging as well. And you can see that this blue shading is the amount of cylindricity of that data set. They're the great circles. This is a non-cylindrical fold, and you can see that the, gray, uh, the blue shading is wider. So you know that immediately you know that that is a non-cylindrical fold. Same here. Now, if you intersect, calculate the intersections of those disks, and you can plot the lineations as well. So what I'm going to show you in all these steronets, the poles of the, the foliations are shown in blue here, and the lineations are shown in, in red, OK? So an application of a rotated grid is this, is rotation, a rotated core, for example. You know, you have uh, the drill hole plunges plotted in red, and then you have the poles of, the, of some foliation or bedding or something like that. And you can see that that is distributed along the small circles. So that's a simple application of that. All right. We combine that with uh, grade analysis in the real world, which is a bit different from what you guys are dealing with. The inspiration comes from drawings, like people, when they make sketches, you can see that people draw, you know, ellipses to represent parts of the body. You can do that at all scales. A whole, whole human, oh, sorry, a whole human, for example, here, you can actually um, represent that as an, an ellipse. In three dimension, it'll be an ellipsoid. OK, so I'm just going to show quickly how this works. So I'm just going to zoom up. You can see vaguely continuities along these directions. I'm going to show you a zoomed up version of that. And I, I clip it to high grades like this. And you can compute the uh, local foliation, grade foliation. And that's the grade lineation. Together, you have the grade lineation, the foliation. But what they represent are ellipsoids. The ellipsoids are grade continuity at that actual point. Um, yeah, it's called um, LVA, but it's, it's, I don't like that name. If someone can think of a better name, that would be great. But 
that's used in the uh, literature traditionally. So I, 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 yeah, I used it locally varying in isotropy ellipsoids. So when you plot the grade foliations, they look like this. That's obviously non-cylindrical. You can see that, that blue band dipping towards the northwest. Uh, lineations look like that. And if you combine it, they look like this. If you look at a cigar-shaped uh, grade distribution, the plot, the Sterinet plot would look like this. And um, if you rotate that grid to a polar coordinate position relative to the object, it looks like this. So you have the, the lineation vertical and the foliation has been plotted as poles and that's, that's what it looks like. If you look at an oblate shape, pancake shape, that's what it looks like in the, in the Sterinet plot. Polar plot, and in a triaxial situation, you get somewhere in between. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to describe five different deposits. I'll start with number one, and at the end of number one, I'll get you to vote on what commodity is represented by each of these deposits and see if you can actually sort of guess. So this is a type of fold politic migmatites. If you have worked on any of these deposits, don't vote, please, because you know the answer already. Um, very highly lineated. There's a fault right down the bottom. And uh, this is an oblique view of it, sideways view. You can see that there's a displacement of the, of the continuity here, right here at that boundary. And these are the grade disks. Looking down plunge, so you can actually see these uh, nice folds developed here. So this is a folded deposit. They're the disks, red disks, and these are the lineations. So when you plot them, the, L, the lineation, grade lineations look like this, and the foliation poles look like that. This is a simulation here. So the simulation has 20 to 1.4 to 1 in isotropy. So this is highly lineated, prolate deposit. This is with the polar plot, and the fault is plotted as the, this pink great circle. Now, what I'm going to do is separate out, domain out the, this area from this area, or from actually the entire area, and then compare the orientations and the grade as well. So grade, grade-wise, you can just sort of look at it and see it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah, in the hanging wall, you can see that that distribution here, the linear distribution. And this is pretty much, it's a bit, bit more planar because you can see a concentration of the foliation poles, but it's pretty similar to me. As to the polar plot. So, I want to introduce you to the real world deposit style classification scheme that I came up with. It's really simple, easy to remember, you'll never forget it, I'll guarantee it. And um, nothing like the real world, you know, the VMS and all that sort of stuff, which is a bit vague uh, in my mind. So it looks like this. It's a bit complicated, but it's not that bad. Um, this high-grade contrast, low-grade contrast. So if the, the, if the deposit, if you look at both sides of the discontinuities, if the grades are pretty much the same, that's low-grade contrast down here. If it's different, it's high-grade contrast, okay? All right, on either side of the boundary, if you examine the shapes and isotropy of the grades on either side of the boundary, if they're the same or similar, like the one that I just showed you, it'll be matched in isotropy. On the other side, if it's completely different, it'll be mismatched in isotropy, okay? Now, one thing you have to remember that at that boundary, you can have some sliding, so you can have translation, rotation, and so forth, but if you just examine the shape, you just, that's what you're looking at. Now, to make it a bit more simple, I have a way of actually sort of to describe showing this. These are just ellipse representation of ellipsoids. So you just think of an ellipsoids, but at the boundary, planar tectonic boundary, in this column here, they match, all right? But, and in this, this row, they're the same, same grades, but 
there's a mismatch on this side, all right? But this is too scientific and too logical for some executives. So we want a more, like a better marketing system to sort of uh, show people how to use this. Um, if you think of compatibility, what do you think of? I think of couple compatibility, you know, couples. So I'm going to use couples as an example. So this one here. <laughs> Kath and Kel style. So, you know, you can immediately see that they're very similar. They match each other. On the other hand, Kardashian West style, they've, you can see the contrast between, so you can always remember that. On the other hand, when you have a mismatch situation, you have the Shaquille style. <laughs> But the, uh, the rarest type is actually this other one here, down here, the ITC style, which is the uh, inappropriate Thai couple style. So, <laughs> I don't laugh. This is, this is actually serious, actually, because it's based on the sacred holy scriptures by the oracles. This, this one here. <laughs> uh, I, this, uh, the oracles, Hobbes and Ord, they, they came up, you know, I... I use the uh, diagrams from there. And this is totally unsponsored, by the way. I, no one's paying me this. Bruce, did you hear that? No, one, no one's paying me. No, no. <laughs> okay, if you look at their uh, diagram in page 64, this is the strain states across a boundary, okay? You can have, if you have a continuous boundary, if you strain it and look at it across this, this particular boundary, you can have an allowed situation, which represents on this side, left side of the diagram, and a not allowed, which is really representing this side. So that's, that's what it's based on. So it is, it is actually based on science. I discussed the concept of Perkins' discontinuities in an article on LinkedIn two years ago. These are transverse fractures that cross-cut fold axes, as shown. Here, these are upright folds. They have asymmetrical grades across these boundaries. Now, how do they fit into this uh, classification matrix? In this matrix here, these cells that are shaded in pink, this is where the Perkins discontinuities fit. Uh, the, across the Perkins discontinuities, they either have grade contrast, shown here, or geometrical contrast. This is the only cell that can be explained by uh, continuity across the boundary and uh, can be explained by fault displacement. So what is deposit one? So this is where you... So this one here is Kath and Kel style. Because the anisotropy is the same, the grade is the same across that boundary. So what do you think the... Um, the grades are. I'm going to start the countdown for 10 seconds only, okay? So, and I'm not going to show you the results until the end because I'm going to discuss each of these deposits at the end of my presentation. Deposit two. The grade distribution from above, plan view, looks like this. These are tightly folded turbidites. This is a... Um, looking along the, the long axis, okay? So looking along this way, along towards the north, that's what it looks like, and that's my estimate of the plane of grade continuity in that, in that uh, view. I'm going to be plotting that and staring at. Now, obviously, this, this deposit has high-grade zones, low-grade zones, and so forth. They alternate across these straight boundaries, which have been mapped by mine geologists. So I've selected out these, and I plot them on a stair in it each. So this is the high grade zone here. Foliation poles in blue, again. This is the low grade zone. You can see that they're pretty much parallel, right? Pretty similar. <coughs> these, are, these are the um, same plots, but the grades are actually represent the colors. So they represent the colors here. That's my estimate estimated plane of uh, grade continuity. And you can show these as uh, grade circles as well, colored according to the grade as well. Now, when I do these, you'll notice that there are huge numbers involved. 
23,000 points. Now, I, I have, you know, data sets up to, you know, 60,000 points in some of these plots. So I'm dealing with a lot of data. But that's because I'm dealing with grade data, which is, you know, obtained from drilling. These are the cross faults. So what, what do you think this, this style is? The grade has a mismatch, so it has to be high contrast. So it'll be this, Kardashian style, right? So what element are we looking at here? Cast your votes, please. OK, this is a longitudinal view of another folded ho fold hosted deposit, folded shales, minor conglomerates, and uh, sandstones. These are the uh, grade foliations. Grade lineations here. You can see the nice plunge here represented right here. So if I look at this, looking down the, the, the plunge, antiform plunge, it looks like this. So this is the estimated axial plane of this deposit. That's my estimate, visual estimate. If you zoom up to those areas, you can see that the grade curls around at these spots. So it is continuous. So there's no discontinuity from here to here. It's actually curving, but still continuous, OK? Now, so I, I take the fold hinge area, and I plot that, and also compare it to what you have in the fold limb. And they happen to be fairly similar. That's my estimated axial plane. These are the foliation, grade foliations, grade lineations. And this is a oblate style, right? Because the lineations are not clustered. They're sort of distributed in the plane. So that, this is oblate. Pancake shape. These are just showing the um, angular densities, but the angular densities in, in this case here near the, near the fold hinge uh, spread out a lot more along the grade circle, which means that you are looking at a curved section, the, that hinge section of that fold. Polar plot, very similar. Now, if you take the grade and plot that, it looks like this. This is in the fold limb. This is in the hinge and the great circle of that. So they look very similar to each other, other than the fact that the grades are quite different across this boundary, the axial plane. So what style would this be? So the anisotropy is fairly similar, but there's a high grade contrast, so it'll be that, that style. All right, see what you think of this one. Cast your vote, please. Deposit four. This is a geological model of that area. The, the deposit itself is located here. I'll show you a long section of that. Uh, it's in an anticline uh, hinge zone, okay? The plunge is going that way. Uh, these are some basalts. They're located in uh, some clastic rocks and, and volcanic rocks as well. Uh, you'll note that there are some faults cutting across it like this. So this is the anticlinal plunge. You can see the, the overall system is plunging that way, except this part is a bit different. There's a high-grade, low-grade contrast in this area. These are the drill holes. And that is a fault that divides the low-grade and high-grade area. And once you twist it about the pole of that fault, you can actually see that. So when, when you actually spin this around about the normal of that fault, you can clearly see that this is a faulted boundary. At least there's a discont discontinuity, OK? And this can be simulated with these ellipsoids that I showed you earlier. So clearly discontinuous. <coughs> so
So this is what the plot looks like on the low grade side. So there's two different domains. So this is plunging towards the northeast. These are the grade delineations over here. These are colored by gray. Grade foliation along um, a non-cylindrical zone. And on the high grade side, you get this, which is completely different. You can see that the plunge is towards the south. And the plunge itself, this lineation here, is very similar. It's almost in that plane of that fault. That's one thing to remember. But it's definitely not hinge parallel. So when you plot this using grade circles, they look quite different. Orientation's different, and the grades are completely different as well. You can clearly see that. So how would I classify this? I would classify as the Shaquille style, because the, you know, there's a mismatch with the geometry across the boundary and also the grade. OK, quiz. Forgot about the quiz. So what element are we dealing with here? The last one, it looks like this in almost plan view, but I'm actually looking along that fault. There is a fault here which has been documented. It has a dextral 200 meter displacement, which is marked by these two lines here. That's the extent of the displacement you have along this fault. These are the high grades. So when you look at this, it's when you consider that displacement, it's kind of odd. This one continues this way. Oh, by the way, this is in a, a large anticlinorium. It's sitting in a large anticlinorium. In fact, all of these deposits are actually fold related. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So 200 meter, if you slide this back here, then it's still, there's, there's a bit missing, right? This appears to be continuous. You know, perhaps there's low grade here. If you slide that back 200 meters, it won't match up with this one. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's actually a very confusing boundary. So you cannot explain the, dis, the apparent displacements that you see here based on the displacements that people know. It's not consistent with the geological evidence. Now, the west side is this side, OK? The north is actually pointing that way. So west side looks like this. You have the grade lineation plunging maybe 20 degrees, something like that towards the southeast, and the distribution of grade foliation you can see there, non-cylindrical. And the grade distributions are seen over here. And if you plot just the foliation values, they look like this. And sometimes what I do is to plot the normals of the lineation, because sometimes if you have a linear deposit, and when you show the grade circles orthogonal to the lineation, it's very clear. You can see the clear pattern there as well. So I do that sometimes. This is on the eastern side, across that boundary. And it looks, orientation-wise, it looks very similar here. And that's the linear orthogonal grade circles. So these are the, the foliation, grade foliations from this deposit. They, they look pretty similar to me. And the lineations, they do look similar. And that's, the bound, that's that fault that I was talking to you about. So the high grades with the fault. So what style is this? Well, I classified it as initially Shaquille style, but I've changed my mind since then. Um, and so I'm going to classify it as ITC. Now, the reason is the grade values across the boundary is pretty much, it looks pretty much the same. But you can't match those two grades together on either side of that boundary. So um, yes, this is why I would uh, classify it as ITC. So what do you think about this deposit? Is it hard? Everyone's nodding over there. Is the classification style, I mean, is that hard? That's not hard, right? That's easy to understand. 
I'm going to reveal to you the deposits. Deposit number one is Challenger Gold in uh, South Australia. Um, this one, can you, see some, can you see something in here that's kind of interesting in this area? We're looking down plunge of the folds. Can you see something? John Standing would know. Because you did work here. And uh, this is actually what I interpreted to be, after, after, based on John Standing's field work, actually, in, in the uh, mine, this, I think, is an F1 fold. And these are F2 folds. And that fits in perfectly with John's excellent work. Um, and that's what I, how I interpret it. What I find fascinating about this deposit is that F1 and F2 are coaxial, they're collinear. And this is something that you find in many fold belts. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, just, I visited Birmingham recently, is because at that location you have F1 and F2 that are collinear as well. Fascinating deposit. So, according to this, it could have been, this deposit could have been continuous like this, like in a fold, and then faulted later on. So I have a little diagram to explain how to work out the timing of mineralization here. And this is pre-fold. The, the maximum, I'm talking about the maximum age of the mineralization. It has to be pre-fold, okay? Because the anisotropies and the grades match on either side of that fault. That makes sense. Okay, before I discuss the audience vote on deposit number one, um, I didn't uh, actually talk about these um, votes at the talk, so I'm slotting these in. Uh, these are the profession, professions of the people who, who attended. Uh, one third were female, which is good, compared to previous uh, conferences that I've attended of this series. Okay, deposit number one was the Challenger Gold Deposit, and most people thought it was gold, but some people thought it was nickel uh, and zinc. I'd be very much interested what why people thought it was a nickel deposit. Maybe because it's very straight. I don't know. Deposit two is Ballarat East, is gold again. Uh, the, we all know the cross-sections of these styles of deposits because it's been around, been around for 100 years you know, or more. And uh, it's been documented clearly in the past. So Ballarat East, the grades don't match up across those faults, those cross-faults. So the mineralization is actually post-folding. Yeah? The folding happened, then these cross-faults occurred, so the maximum age of this mineral deposit has to be post-folding. I hope you agree with that. Deposit number two, Ballarat East. And this is gold, and most people thought it was gold. And um, one of the questions I didn't ask was whether the commodities that people work on. And I suspect in Kalgoorlie most people are working on gold, so I think there might be a gold bias here. But anyway... Um, the crowd got this one right. Deposit number three is Mount Isa. Mount Isa Fold. Mount Isa Fold has been illustrated in many cross sections like this. You, you'd be able to find this diagram in many papers. So this has been known in the industry for decades. Isn't that right, Dale? You work there, yeah? Now. The timing of the mineralization of this deposit, this is supposed to be a syngenetic deposit, but what is the timing of this deposit? And the answer is right here, underneath your nose. For decades, you've been staring at this. It actually tells you what the timing of mineralization is. It has to be sin-fold, right? Sin or post-fold. The axial plane had to exist before this type of mineralization had happened. You cannot get this in a syngenetic deposit. And in fact, this is F4. You have many folding events before this. So the mineralization of Mount Isa happened right at the end, after this folding. And basically, this can be summarized in a page. But people have been carrying on about this syngenetic model for decades. This is an example of what, what this looks like 
in a, in a slab. This is a BIF. But you can see that the Chalcedony mineralization, the, the, the tiger's eye on this side, is hemmed in by the axial surface. So that mineralization has to be late. It's not, it's not really early. OK, so this is mineralized on one side. This is the model. And so in this case, Mount Isa here, <laughs> Sinfold is the maximum age. It could be postfold, but Sinfold has to be the maximum age. Can't be earlier than that. The crowd vote for copper, but then again, this is a base metal deposit for Mount Isa. So copper, lead, zinc, uh, they're pretty yeah, represented here. So I think this one's pretty close, interestingly, uh, out of 110 people. Deposit fault is Helia VMS. This is a uh, barite distribution in, in this deposit. And you can see the easy streak fault. And this is what this fault is. This fault that I showed you earlier. Oh, OK. So this is, this is copper. Lead, zinc, and, and barium, right? And the barium shows the most contrast. So I use barium. But you can actually pick up the fact that lead, zinc, they're all low grade in the high barium area. And that's easy street fault. Easy street fault has to be post folding because it cuts across the fold at Hellier, right? This is not easy st street, this is called jack fault. And this has been illustrated in, in papers. So I'm just going to go up and look at sections that are uh, down plunge oriented, orthogonal to down plunge. And I can see that um, this e yellow one, that's easy street fault. It comes across this way. And you can see that the fossil deposit, the high grade, is actually on one side of, the of that fault. And that fault has to be post folding. This is the little. Demonstration of where the mineralization is sitting relative to the fold hinge. It's very obvious. It's right along the fold hinge. And the strain is not very high. The um, metamorphic uh, grade is very low, lower than green schist. So we take a look at that and look at that. And you can see that published diagram here is actually that area. What it doesn't show you is what happens to the basalt on either side. It actually is a fold hinge. But instead, what the authors emphasize is that they, they show this diagram and um, make it into this. Now, in that case, the symmetry axis of that deposit would have to be vertical. Okay, So your, your staring net plot, your origin of your staring net plot would have to be orthogonal to bedding. But it isn't. It's actually parallel to the fold axis. So we see a lot of this diagram here, a lot of these diagrams all the time. And these systems predict a lineation that is orthogonal to the stratigraphy, but they aren't. So yeah, what alteration pipe? These guys suggest that there's an alteration pipe in the footwall. I don't see it. It's not normal. It's not normal to the stratigraphy. It's parallel to the stratigraphy. So I've taken some surfaces, the basal surface of this basalt that I modeled, taking that and I plotted it on a stair net here. You can see that it's, it's a non-cylindrical surface. You plot the grades in relation to that side by side. That's grade foliation. You can see that that's related to that. That is a fold-related deposit. And the plunge of the grade lineation coincides with this. So it's a perfect example of fold-hosted uh, sulfide deposit. And the timing, more importantly, is uh, post-faulting after that fault. So Helia is right down here, and it's post-fold, right? So the maximum age has to be post-fold. This, this cannot be a VMS, like a traditional syn genetic VMS. That's, can't be possible. I didn't expect the crowd to get this one and um, bury him here. And most people thought this was a gold deposit, which is rather interesting. And um, that's my whole point about this exercise is that 
you can't actually tell the difference between various mineral deposits, especially have the same if you have the same features like this, and you have one-sided mineralization across a fracture. Then it's very difficult to tell. It, this looks very much like you know, examples from the Victorian goldfields. 120 people voted. Deposit five is Cambald and Nickel. So this is uh, considered to be a magmatic deposit. For those who are unfamiliar with the Archean Cambalda nickel deposits of the Yorgan Craton, these nickel deposits are interpreted to be synvolcanic and in place during rifting. Their elongated geometries are interpreted as formed parallel to channelized comatiite flows, which means that they would have formed well before the Cambalda dome deformation in which these nickel deposits are situated. There are also orogenic gold deposits of various ages situated at this location. But because the nickel deposits are thought to have formed before folding, you'd expect their geometries to be consistent with this interpretation. For example, I would expect the nickel deposits to be displaced by later faulting that post-dates the formation of the Cambelder Dome. So if you guys can use cross-eyed stereo, if you cross, -eye, cross your eyes and you just what, see this, it's fantastic. Um, that's the Alpha Island Fault, which is, has a known displacement across it, and you can see that the grades abut against the Alpha Island Fault. But this, this apparent displacement cannot be explained by fault displacement. I explained that before. Now, what's so interesting is that when you look at the gold grades, they have the same sort of pattern. Look at this. You have continuous in this, in this area, in this deposit, right across the, the fault, this one terminates against the fault. These ones terminate against the fault. These go right across. So there's, there's no consistency in the continuity of these grades across, these fault, across this particular fault. Now, who can guess which plot is nickel and which plot is gold? You can take a guess. Can't tell, right? These are the grade foliations in great circle plot. Cambelda nickel sits right here. It has to be post-fold. Now, the, this Alpha Island fault here with these um, nickel deposits, it, it's been, I mean, this is from, from a publication, it's been known that these deposits but against this fault. This is a cross section of it here. Uh, the magmatic nickel literature is, is littered with cartoons like this, which I find really unbelievable. One thing that I wanted to look for was an undeformed comatiite channel. I have not found it in the literature. If anyone knows of this, I would like to see it because I mean, I'm a sedimentologist as well, and I studied fluvial sedimentology, and we studied channel geometries, you know? And we didn't go to deform deposits to sort of set, get good examples. We go to pristine, non-deformed rocks in order to understand fluvial geometries. Uh, we need to find those. This is the only paper by Don Findlay that is consistent with my observations. Now, he didn't deal with the Alpha Island Fault, but what he presents here in, in terms of Budins and the mineralization is completely different from any, everyone else, and I'm really quite astonished that he was able to publish this. I don't know how he did it, but he managed it. And I think it's standing the test of time. Again, this is 113 people voted, and um, about half of them said this was a gold deposit but it's actually nickel, and um, the grades are very similar across this boundary, but the grades cannot fit back together in a neat, uh, displaced explanation. So, yeah, um, I'm not surprised that people thought this was a gold deposit. So, 20 years from now, in 2042, when James Sidon will host this conference, 
Were the geologists freed from the matrix? That's my big question. Time would only tell, right? Conclusion, we need to escape the matrix. That's what my conclusion. But in order to escape it, you need to know what the matrix is, and it has nothing to do with science. So there's a video link for you if you want to look at it later on, but that's basically it for my talk. Thank you. Something to look forward to. Thanks, Jan. Any questions? We've got about 15 minutes or something, 10 minutes for a tea break. So if anyone has questions. Julian? Julian. What is foliation grade or grade foliation? What is grade lineation? So your grade foliation is your maximum intermediate act, um, plane, right? Normal to the minimum plane. Yeah? Grade, just like just like strain. Grade data in expiration, for instance, are biased down to Sure. Down yeah. Um, so that's why I used really, really good data sets. <laughs> no. Yes, there is that. There is a problem. There can be a problem if I mean I can't do this with one drill hole, obviously. You know, you need some drill holes. And there is a the more you have, the better. But the result you get you know, there's ways of actually sort of um, uh, taking out uncertainties, you know, based on drill. You're making some de decisions about continuity. Are those made by a human or made by the computer? Made by the computer. No, this is all computerized. Yep. You're very stimulating. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it made me think. If you applied your method to the Vidvatas around gold, I'm pretty sure you'd come up with it being late. Yes. I, now, I am, yes. Uh, the, second yep. the second part is the counter to that would be, oh, it's all remobilized. Oh, yeah. That's... That, well, it's a standard response. Yeah, but the thing is, where is the evidence? I mean, you need to actually sort of come up with an evidence. Anyone can say it's remobilized. You have to, like for VMS, for example, people say it's all remobilized into the fold hinge. Well, then, you need to have evidence for that. And you know, all the sulfides don't behave the same way with deformation. You know, I think is a pyrite is very difficult to move, you know. So you you should expect stringers of pyrite in where they occurred before. But in actual fact, you don't get that. You just have a complete absence of where you expect them to be. Like for example, that pipe at Helia. You expect them to be in the pipe, but there is no pipe. It's the only the, the way they displayed it on paper, it looks like a pipe, right? But it, it is an actual cross-section of a, you know, uh, bisymmetric object, you know, bilateral symmetrical. It's not an axial symmetry they're talking about. They don't demonstrate that. They just say it is, but you can't see it in the data. So you haven't looked at the bit about gold by these methods? No, I don't have any data from the vits, no. Do you have any? It sounds like we should get some. Yeah, we should, yeah. Someone will have it. Absolutely. Anyone else questions? I'm still puzzled how you get orientation data yeah. from assay data. That was John, that, that was yeah. Julian's question. Yep, that, you don't get it because you're in the matrix. <laughs> Once you get out of the matrix, I will show you. <laughs> this is not an answer, John. Uh, no, 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 it's not an answer because I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> in a different matrix then than yours. <laughs> no more questions. Yeah, question here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You have the mineralization model up there, and you have mineralization on one side of the fold, but not the other. What? Well, if that's what would you have as the explanation? Would that like be a pressure gradient at the fold axis or something preventing further mineralization on the other side of it? Or you only have to have dilation. You know that limb is in the orientation of that, that allows dilation, probably normal to the the layering. And that so you have you have an orientation like this, and it's in the this normal is expanding this way. 
But this orientation over here, it can't do that because it's in the wrong orientation with respect to the, the strain, strain ellipsoid. I did, I did want to ask a question, June, about something you won't, you know, the, the secret methodology. I um, don't really want to know the secret, but I'll take the red or the blue at some stage. Nugget. How are you accommodating nugget in your calculation of lineage? I don't. You're just using the raw data? Raw data, yeah. If it's completely nuggety, you get it scatter at the short range. But I mean, eventually it'll go to the boundaries of that body. Let's say it's a tabular looking body and uh, you process that, you'll get the tabular continuity. But at the short range, you wouldn't get it. So if, if we follow up on what you just said, how do you get the grade to produce one surface, one plane and one lineation when often the grade is controlled by multiple features, as you're emphasizing. So you can get them, for instance, grade may have a continuity in that direction and in that direction. There might be more than one. Yes. Yep. There could be the control and then the vein control, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are normal issues of domaining. They, that's, that's basically a domaining issue. So you have um, you know, different scales, different continuities. Even at one spot, you might have different continuities. But at, at the scale of the mining that we're interested in, I have to really concentrate on the, mine, the deposit sort of continuity scale. That's what I'm interested in. I don't get too much, you know, get into the nitty gritty to the small scale. Once you get to that scale, you're going to have data problems anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a problem. It's still a problem that I have to deal with.